With all the military might of the imperialist powers, all the most sophisticated propaganda campaigns, with all the money in the world, the U.S. cannot hide all of socialism's successes. Where are we hiding them? <laughs> really, where, where are they? I'd love to know. Hi, I'm Hannah Cox with the Foundation for Economic Education, and you're about to watch my new show, Rigged, where I'm going to react to a YouTube video called Why So Many People Are Losing Faith in Capitalism. Let's dive in. Apple pie, baseball, combination KFC Taco Bell, miles of identical strip malls off every highway. Few things are more quintessentially American than these pillars of Western culture. I can already see this is going like, oh no, identical strip malls, there's too many businesses, too many options. I think I know who this guy is. Keep it, keep it going. But there's one more feature of American life that most people, until recently, would tell you is just as American as apple pie. Capitalism. While it may seem strange that an economic system has become such an integral part of millions of American personalities, if you look at this country's long history of pro-capitalist propaganda and anti-communist rhetoric, it becomes pretty clear why so many people are violently defensive of a system that no longer benefits the average person. Violently defensive. Violently, yeah, okay. But if recent trends continue, we'll soon see a radically different, more modern United States in the coming years. In this episode, we're going to talk about recent polling that shows a decline in favorability of capitalism and a surge towards socialism. Now, before we get into the good stuff, I think it's important for me to offer a little disclaimer. For those who are new to the channel, I present commentary on current events, culture, and politics from a socialist perspective. Socialist does not mean liberal. Liberals still want to operate within the capitalist framework. But socialists, as the label suggests, advocate for socialism, an entirely different economic system. I present my content at a 101 level, so if you're confused about a certain topic and the socialist perspective on it, I recommend checking out some of my other videos. Okay, I'm also really curious, he hasn't said this yet, but I really want to hear him explain what he thinks capitalism is and what it is that people are turning against, because I guarantee you the vast majority of people who are turning against capitalism are actually turning against government intervention into the market, not capitalism. But let's see. Let's see if he proves me right. With that out of the way, let's talk about why so many people are beginning to sour on capitalism in favor of socialism. Over the last few years, most notably since about 2016, there has been a significant resurgence of interest in socialism among younger Americans. As scary as some news outlets have tried to make this trend seem, socialism isn't new in America. A hundred years ago, the U.S. had a large and thriving socialist party. Unions were strong and represented workers effectively. Uh, no. Let's talk about what happened a hundred years ago the last time we saw a socialist resurgence. What we ended up getting was FDR, one of the biggest monsters to ever come through the presidency in the U.S., and we saw things like the New Deal implemented that we still live with the ramifications of today. These policies that they put in place have not ended poverty. They have not made people wealthier. In fact, what they've done is come in and slow down progress and make a lot of us poorer, and that's the last time we saw socialist resurgence in this, in this country. Right now, we are seeing more interest in socialism than we have in previous decades, but it's still a very small percentage of the country. In fact, it's such a small percentage that the Democratic Party at large knows it cannot run national candidates who hold these beliefs. They constantly are trying to push more moderate candidates, like we saw in the last election with Joe Biden, because they know that a person like Bernie Sanders on their ticket will lose miserably because the vast majority of people know that socialism does not work, and that every time it has been attempted, it has led to destitution and massive deaths. And we even had a candidate from the Socialist Party win a million votes in the 1920 presidential race. What's more impressive, he did it from a prison cell. Eugene Debs had been locked up for speaking out against the First World War, an act that was considered sedition at the time. The aspects of socialism that appealed to Americans back then were the same that appeal to them today. Socialists have always championed policies well ahead of their time. In the early 1900s, those policies included workplace safety laws, the 40-hour workweek, child labor laws, the 8-hour workday, and universal suffrage. These things were all unthinkable at but the time. Pause. We increasingly see people in my generation, me included, who have no desire to sit in an office five days a week from 9 to 5. We don't need to do that to get our work done. It's not a good quality of life. But because the socialists went and implemented these things that tied the government power 
to the workplace and told employers that they had to have these kinds of stipulations, that this was the kind of structure they had to offer employees, we're still stuck with these really antiquated ideas to this day. Before FDR came along and the New Deal was passed, we had already seen many of these changes starting to be implemented. We had already seen workers banding together and lobbying on their own behalf. And that's a fine thing for them to do. I think there's nothing wrong with unions when they are just simply collective agreements among workers who are pushing for change out in the actual um, economic sector. Instead, what we see happen under FDR, though, is the unions start coercing people through government power, making them join unions, and that actually, again, slowed down progress. But we didn't need it. We already saw that child labor was diminishing as our economy improved. We saw that we were seeing worker conditions improve as they band together to get better safety provisions in the workplace. So largely, the evidence that we even needed the government to come in and do these things is really not there, and I think there's plenty to show that it actually did the opposite and slowed down progress. These things were all unthinkable at the time. Fast forward to today, and not much has changed. Progressive, worker-oriented policies are still wildly popular, and it's only through massive corporate lobbying and extensive propaganda campaigns that the ruling class has been able to prevent such policies from becoming the norm. The U.S. has been particularly successful in this regard. This country is now the only industrialized nation not to offer some form of universal health care. Let's talk about the universal health care in other countries. I cannot stand this myth. I actually did a whole episode of my own show on this a few months ago, examining these democratic socialist countries that they constantly point to who have health care. Those countries pay upwards of 50% per person, and I'm not talking about the wealthy, I'm talking about the middle average people, pay 50 plus percent of their income in taxes to get health care, to get free college, and to get child care. Now, you need to sit back and ask yourself, is that a good deal? For me, as a single person with no kids who does not want kids, that's a terrible deal. Why would I want to pay 50 plus percent of my income for those three basic things, one of which I will never use? In exchange for that, they also do not have these perfect healthcare systems that they keep selling people. They essentially have a system where you can walk in and get emergency care for free. You can see a general practitioner for free, although it probably will take you quite some time to get to see any doctors, which is why we see oftentimes people in these countries are traveling to the US to get actual healthcare services. That happens in Canada quite frequently. We also see that people in those countries carry additional insurance packages to cover everything else that their socialist um, government does not actually provide under that healthcare system. So at the end of the day, it's not a better system. You're not getting that much more for free. And ultimately, even when you are getting a free service, you're likely going to wait a very long time, which can be life and death when you're waiting on a surgery, on a kidney transplant, on cancer treatments, on scans that could identify some of these serious diseases. There is no evidence that these countries have better healthcare systems than we do. Now, what I will concede to the socialists is that our healthcare system has progressively gotten worse under their ideas. Throughout the past hundred years, as they have progressively implemented more and more government control of our healthcare sector, which could in no fantasy be called a capitalist system at this point, we have seen costs continue to go up and we have seen the ability for people to access care decrease. And that's for a multitude of reasons. First and foremost, it's, it's because they are curtailing the supply because of all these regulations and red tape we see fewer people actually want to enter the practice and become doctors because they don't get to actually practice and spend time with their patients. Instead, they have to spend all of their time processing paperwork for the government. We also see prices go up because of that restriction in supply and because of all the regulations and red tape the government has put on the actual services. So I think something does need to be done about our healthcare system, but what we don't need is more government control, which is what created the problems in our healthcare system in the first place. We have no federally mandated parental leave. Unions have been gutted. Benefits our parents and grandparents took for granted have been stripped away. Pensions are no longer offered. Full-time benefits are essentially non-existent. Paid sick days are incredibly rare. I see no evidence of that. In fact, as I've been in the workforce for the past 10 years, increasingly, I see more and more companies offering things like unlimited time off, Every single company I've ever worked at has offered benefits. They've offered 401k and matching. It is a myth that the majority of jobs in this country do not offer benefits or have these kinds of services. Now, it might be true that certain kinds of minimum wage jobs or hourly jobs do not offer these kinds of services, but that is because those jobs are not supposed to be careers. You should not be looking towards minimum wage jobs, hourly jobs to bake, to make your whole career out of. Those are supposed to be entry level jobs where people learn a skill set and then they improve and they can continue to progressively get better jobs. We actually see across the country that people have access to a wide berth of new careers that are coming up due to technology and the trades. We have 
So many jobs up for grabs these days, we cannot get people to fill them. There is a massive labor shortage in this country. That means that the actual employees have the bargaining power and they can use it to get these things that they're not already offered. We see that happening without government as minimum wage employees at places like Amazon and Facebook have pushed not only for really high minimum wage entry level jobs, like $15 an hour jobs, they're also using it to get many benefits. We see Amazon and Starbucks now paying for people's colleges. That's a huge benefit that workers are getting without government pushing. So the evidence here that they're trying to convince you of is simply, again, not there. And most American workers don't even get major holidays off. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, we're all working Christmas and Thanksgiving and we can't get off. That's based. I don't know how people just come on YouTube and say these kinds of things and give absolutely nothing to back it up. There is nothing to back this up whatsoever. And this is what the definition of propaganda actually is, is when people come on and try to attest that things are not actually there and that you're that things are worse than they are and that you need to have this other system come in and save you. There's nothing backing this up at all. In the face of this ever worsening labor landscape, it's unsurprising that young people entering the job market are drawn to politicians like Bernie Sanders. Bernie campaigned as a democratic socialist, and that was most young Americans' first real experience with the ideology. That being said, if you take Bernie's platform and chart it among politicians from other nations, he'd fall squarely in the social democrat camp. Not actually socialist, but getting towards the furthest left reaches of capitalism. It can be kind of confusing for newbies to hear the term social democrat. It can be kind of confusing because social democrat or democratic socialism is a made up term. It does not exist. There is socialism and there is capitalism. The systems that Bernie likes to point to are not democratic socialist countries. In fact, they are capitalist countries. In fact, they rank higher on economic freedom indexes than we do most of the time. They have strong capitalist economies, which is how they are able to generate so much wealth that they can tax their populations at 50% to fund their very, very large welfare programs. They want to confuse you and tell you that that is what Bernie is pushing. It is not. What Bernie is actually pushing is real socialism, and its policies actually look a lot closer to those that you would find in Venezuela or Cuba than they do in Sweden. A capitalist system is essentially one where in, a, in an ideal world, you do not see government involved in the market. You see buying and trading freely among people, among countries, and you see people essentially pay for the majority of the services they need in a society out of their own pocket. You would see very low taxes, and you would not see government in control of any industry, whether that be by completely taking it over and operating the industry, or whether it be by them heavily regulating it and controlling it and funding it. Either way, you're moving away from a capitalist system. Under socialism, under true socialism, what you see is government coming in and actually taking over industries, again, either through heavily funding and regulating them and controlling them, or through usurping the means of production altogether. The difference is what Bernie points to in places like the Norwegian countries, they have a capitalist economy. The government is actually not very involved in the goings-ons of their business transactions. In fact, they have unions, but they have nothing to do with the government there. They do collectively bargain amongst their people and the employers. The government stays out of it. They have free trade. They have... Um, very few restrictions on actual industry, low regulations, low corporate welfare. The government mostly does stay out of the market there. They then do do something that I don't particularly agree with or like, where they tax their citizens very heavily, and they use those taxes, again, to basically distribute or redistribute income so that citizens can pay for health care, basic health care, child care, and basic tuition for college out of their pockets with those taxes and democratic socialist and understand the difference. Social Democrats like Bernie or AOC advocate for heavy regulation on capitalism. They basically want to defang the exploitative capitalist system and establish more worker-friendly policies. And they understand the importance of fighting climate change to mitigate the fallout. Socialists don't think that's sufficient. They want to dismantle capitalism entirely, as they believe its economic structure is built upon exploitation of both American workers and of workers in the global south and is therefore inherently unreformable. As of right now, I wouldn't say there are any actual socialists in federal office. That's not to diminish the role people like Bernie have played in getting young people interested in left politics. But it's important to understand that when outlets like Fox and CNN try to cast run-of-the-mill social democratic politicians as some far-left communist threat, what they're really doing is trying to put a hard limit on what economic ideas are acceptable in the US. Okay, I think that's enough background. 
Let's talk about the newest bit of evidence for the leftward shift among American young people. According to a new poll by Axios, only half of younger Americans now hold a positive view of capitalism. Maybe that's because they're being lied to about what capitalism is and told that the problems in our economic system are the result of capitalism versus the massive government regulations and infringements into the market that people like Bernie and AOC advocate. Just, just a thought. This is a pretty significant change. Just two years ago, the margin was a massive 20 points, with 58% of 18 to 34 year olds reporting a positive opinion of capitalism and 38% a negative opinion. Now, the numbers are much closer. Among the same age group, 49% view capitalism favorably and 46% unfavorably. This shift has been driven in large part by Gen Z, those aged 18 to 24. This age group has just 42% positive opinion and a striking 54% negative. Unsurprisingly, the 35 to 64 and 65 plus age groups have remained largely unchanged. So all this says to me is that this is evidence of our school system being an utter failure. Because if there was actual history being taught in our school system, if there were actual economics being taught in our school system or civics, there is no way that anybody could have a positive view of socialism. It's absurd. This is a ideology that has killed more people and caused more destitution than any in recent memory. It's a deadly ideology. It does not work. It's been proven as a failure time and time again. And on the contrary, we see that capitalism, when attempted, even imperfectly like here in the US, has consistently produced massive wealth generation and quickly increasing standards of living. It's, it's led to longer lifespans. The evidence here is overwhelming. And if younger people don't know that, it is simply proof that our government schools are working as indoctrination camps and not actually teaching students what they need to know to go out into the world and participate in our system. With both groups reporting high favorability for capitalism, what is surprising is that young Republicans have actually trended away from capitalism as well. In 2019, 81% of Republicans and right-leaning people aged 18 to 34 had a positive view of capitalism. Today, that number has fallen to 66%. That's pretty shocking considering just how aggressively Republicans tend to defend yeah. capitalism. So this is an issue I've had with Republicans for a long time. They like to say that they support capitalism. And when I first got into politics, I was fully under the impression that that's what we all stood for. As I started working around state legislatures and U.S. politics at the national level, I quickly began to realize that many of the Republicans were also passing bills and pushing ideas that were not, in fact, capitalism, which I think goes back to our government schools failing to actually teach people just basic economic theory. Capitalism has become a buzzword on the right, beginning with Ronald Reagan and really continuing through up until Trump. I don't think that the majority of young people are actually being taught what this school of thought entails. And so therefore, they're not able to identify when somebody tells them that they're supporting capitalism and then goes and does the opposite. So I think when you see this rise of populism on the right, it really mirrors what's happening on the left, which is funny because really, if you look at economic theory and political theory, socialism goes so far left and nationalism goes so far right that they tend to kind of meet over here in this really deadly combination. And that's really what we see happening in the U.S. right now, where you have these two still very fringe movements. I want to remind everybody this is not where the majority of Americans are. In fact, most Americans are much more in the middle of the two parties over here and do still support capitalism. But what we see happening is this rise of populism where people are rightfully upset about things that are happening in our system. They are rightfully upset that the rich keep getting richer and that they keep working and working harder like they were told to and they don't feel like they're getting ahead. They don't feel like they're able to re reach these milestones like buying houses or starting a family. And they're not wrong to be upset because we again have had decades and decades of government intervention into the market, infringements on capitalism that have made us poorer, that have made it harder to get ahead, that actually have resulted in really unfair conditions that you would not see under true free market capitalism. But because these groups are not able to actually identify identify the root cause of the problems, we see them instead really starting to revolt against old systems. And so I think that's happening on the right with Trump supporters. I think it's happening on the left with Bernie supporters. And again, unfortunately, they are both trending towards very anti-capitalist views. On the right, you see them turning against free speech, turning against free trade. On the left, you see them, um, as I think they always have, turning against actual um, free markets as a whole. So this is a problematic thing that we need to get a hold of because, again, 
both of their solutions are really just more government control, more government regulations, and more government intervention in the market, which is what created the problems they're upset about in the first place. So they're being very misled and they're voting to their own detriment right now. Interestingly, the shift towards socialism has been slower than the shift away from capitalism. If I had to guess, I would suspect that the decades of anti-communist propaganda that has been hammered into the American psyche since the Cold War is the main roadblock. If I had to guess, it would be the millions of people who have died and starved under communism. Just, just a gander. And make no mistake, that propaganda continues to this day. Republicans and Democrats alike are united in opposing any leftward shift away from capitalism. It is their one truly bipartisan issue. I think war, I think war is their one truly bipartisan issue, actually. But. Well, I thank you for your question, uh, but I have to say we're capitalist, and that's just the way it is. So, what can we take away from this trend of viewing capitalism less and less favorably? For starters, it's been a long time coming, and those in power have probably been expecting it. Decades of brutalizing the working class and crushing any remnants of the American dream would inevitably lead to a nationwide loss of faith in capitalism eventually. It should lead to a nationwide loss of faith in the government. That being said, the shift is coming at a very dangerous time. Climate change has put a time limit on any attempts at implementing a better, more common sense economic system that is capable of handling the coming crises. As the fallout from climate I change can't, worsens- I not with the climate change stuff. I believe in climate change, but like, the fact that they think they're gonna use this Trojan horse to like slip in socialism because we're all gonna die in a year or two just blows my mind. And actually, if they really cared about climate change, if they were really that concerned, there probably are incremental things they could be doing to work with the market to actually try to move good ideas forward. We have several groups that work on this on the right that actually have proposed free market solutions to climate change. They won't take that deal because it's not actually about climate change. It is about using climate change as an excuse to package socialism and move it in and take over industries. And I'm just, this grift, man. We will begin to hear more eugenicist rhetoric about the Earth's carrying capacity, overpopulation, and the replacement of the, quote, white race. So if we're going to talk about eugenics, I want to point out that Eugene Debs, the person he lauded as a great socialist um, champion back in the 1920s, was himself a very public proponent of eugenics, which is just quite ironic. While many young people are beginning to understand that socialism is the solution, there is a very real counterinsurgency that advocates for a sort of eco-fascism, a supposed solution to climate change that really just further entrenches inequality and the will of global capital. Any good Marxist will be able to tell you that fascism is a natural outgrowth of capitalism in crisis. <laughs> Hold on. Fascism is an out is an outgrowth of capitalism? Like, that is a bonkers statement that I feel pretty sure he's not going to actually back up by anything meaningful whatsoever. Secondarily, for him to say that people on the right are trying to perpetrate inequality with their ideas of how to solve climate change, let's talk about that for a minute. Because their ideas would make energy so expensive that the average person in America would struggle to pay their electric bill, their gas bill. They would struggle to pay for gasoline. This is something where you see their ideology coming in and being exactly the opposite of what they claim to preach. If you actually care about poor people, if you actually care about the average American, then you would recognize that these socialist approaches to climate change would gut the middle class. We cannot afford to pay for their ideas. And the, per the people that would be hurt the most are the people at the margin. So I'm very tired of them pretending that they care so much about inequality, they care so much about people who are on the verge of living in poverty, when their very ideas would continue to push them further down the ladder. This just continues to convince me that this guy has no earthly idea what capitalism is, because again, capitalism is actually very simple. It is just free trading amongst people. Hi, I'd like to buy your apple. Would you like to sell it to me? Yes, I would like to sell you my apple. How much for your apple? $10. Okay, here you go. That's capitalism. It's not that hard. It's not really that difficult to follow. When people come in and start trying to ascribe other things to capitalism that they don't like, racism, inequality, fascism, those are grifters. Those are people who do not have a leg to stand on, and they're trying to make a negative attachment between an economic system and a very deadly, disgusting ideology like fascism. Fascism is the opposite of capitalism. It's the opposite of a system that would uphold capitalism. What capitalism needs to thrive is literally for the government to just get its hands off. Fascism instead has the opposite approach where it comes in and says government should control everything. It's more of a nationalist um, ideology that wants to see government control the day-to-day -day interactions of people, their lifestyle choices, as well as the economic system. 
That is not capitalism. That makes absolutely no sense. When things get bad, fascists circle the wagon around finance capital and begin to lash out. We have, give or take, 15 or 20 years before things potentially get really bad. As the older generations continue to die off, if they are replaced by young people who hold on to their strong egalitarian socialist values, we stand a reasonable chance of enacting positive change and dismantling the system that makes these crises inevitable. But, but they won't hold on to their socialist values because as young people age, they thank God get a little bit smarter and they start making money and they start looking at what the government takes from their paycheck and they start looking at what they get in return. They start looking at what a hot mess our country is and they think, hmm, probably I don't want the government to control every aspect of my life. Probably this system is for children and doesn't actually make sense. And we know that it takes till about the age of 25 for a person's brain to fully develop and I think that's about the time they usually turn away from socialism. If, however, the climate crisis accelerates at a rate that outpaces the growth of socialist sentiment and class solidarity in the U.S. and the rest of the imperial core, things could get pretty grim. Like, this actually makes me, like, root for climate change, the way he's phrasing this. Like, if it's 15 to 20 years until the world ends or 15 to 20 years until we're socialists, like, I think we should just let the world in. It sounds like a much better way to go than having to live under another failed attempt of socialism. No thanks. There's a common expression in socialist circles. Our two possible futures are socialism or barbarism. Socialism or barbarism. I think they're the same, actually. I really can't think of a more barbaric system than socialism where you can't get toilet paper, you can't get basic foods, you can't get Advil off the shelves. Do you see anybody in this capitalist country desperately trying to get over to Cuba and live their dream life of living under communism? Not one. Literally not one. Not even Bernie is trying to go live in Cuba. That is barbaric, where you're killed in the streets for protesting your government, where they disappear people for having views about the way their economy is being run. No thanks. It acknowledges the fact that if we do not reach a consensus that every human being has the right to a decent life, that every nation has the right to self-determination free from imperialist oppression, and that the earth is a finite resource we all share, the worst forces within the existing system will come to the forefront and make existence a living hell for the vast majority of the population. I get a lot of comments on my videos about this current stage of capitalism resembling a technologically advanced form of feudalism. That is more or less correct. As capital tightens its grip on the productive forces, as it claims the last scraps of land, snaps up the planet's remaining resources, and extracts the last bit of value it can squeeze from the working population, we will see the final phase of capitalism. Those who previously had little will have nothing at all. Those who considered themselves middle class will be financially ruined. And those who owned much will own everything. <laughs> Whatever will we do? I just, at the end of the day, nothing he's saying holds up. Yes, there are things we need to fix in this country. And again, they trace right back to government intervention in the market. We have a lot of things that have made us much poorer off. But those things, again, go back to government, and we need to make the government smaller to address them. But even despite those issues in our culture, we still are living in the greatest of all times. I cannot, this doomsday attitude, this victim mentality, like, dude, we have, even the most poor people in America have access to resources and technology that kings would not have dreamed of 100 years ago. It is absurd to act like we're fading into a dystopia or that nobody can get ahead anymore in this country. Nothing backs that up. The problem that I think people like this guy have is that at the end of the day, they want everybody to be equally poor. They cannot stand seeing other people do better than them. And they can't stand the notion that perhaps it's due to something those people have or their own actions. They have to attribute it to something else because they don't want to look within themselves and figure out why they're not getting ahead. And instead of doing that, they try to blame an economic system. This economic system is not draining people of value. In fact, the only way to actually do well under a capitalist system is to provide value to your fellow man. There cannot be infinite growth on a planet with finite resources. Now, don't freak out too much. We're extrapolating quite a bit from this relatively tiny bit of information. Yes, this most recent poll tracks pretty closely with other similar polling, but trends can and do change. I genuinely believe we'll see an increase in the rate of socialism's resurgence in the coming years. There's simply no reason for any normal person to defend capitalism anymore. It just doesn't work for working people. There there are literally like a million reasons to defend capitalism. And they all trace back to people whose lives have been improved under capitalism. At the end of the day, there is no common sense reason to oppose capitalism if you actually understand what capitalism is. 
the vast majority of young people who are turning against it are actually turning against cronyism, and they think they're one and the same. And again, that's a problem of our education system, and it's a problem that I think also belongs to the right, who has often said they champion capitalism while pushing policies that are the exact opposite. And when you do that for long enough, people start to believe you, and they think that these policies like corporate welfare and cronyism and tax handouts and special interests for the rich are capitalism. They're not. They are corruption of capitalism and they are a governmental problem. And so what we have to do is help young people get an actual correct understanding of what free market capitalism is and isn't. And when they do that, they will correctly turn on the actual culprit, which is the government, which the socialists want to empower and give total control. If the American faith in capitalism fades just enough, people will begin to realize that there's a wealth of information on alternative, successful, common sense economics to implement where I want one, one example of a successful socialist system. One, that's all I ask of this guy, I want one. Socialism is tried and tested. The policies work. The only people who claim otherwise either have a vested interest in maintaining the predatory status quo, or are simply unaware of the extent to which capitalist nations meddle in foreign affairs, foment coups in socialist nations, and do their very best to crush budding left-wing governments before they ever have a chance to show the world how amazing they are. I'm, I'm pretty sure we fought an entire like decades long Cold War with Russia, who was trying to like, come in and overtake capitalist economies so they could push their worldview on others. I'm pretty sure China is currently trying to do the same. That, and again, that is a governmental problem. If we see the U.S. entering wars that it shouldn't, and I would actually agree with many of the times they would say that the U.S. should not have entered conflicts, that is not a problem of capitalism. Capitalists over here are just buying and trading goods. That is a problem with government who again, the socialists want to give unilateral power to. This is why I just cannot, their, their whole ideology just goes in circles. And I, I really just cannot wrap my mind around it. They're going to point to all of these atrocities carried out by government and then in the same breath want to empower the government to have total control over our economic lives. It, it just doesn't wash whatsoever. And even still, with all the military might of the imperialist powers, all the most sophisticated propaganda campaigns, with all the money in the world, the U.S. cannot hide all of socialism's successes. Where are we hiding them? <laughs> really, where, where are they? I'd love to know. Vietnam had the best COVID response in the world. Cuba sent their world-class doctors to the places that needed the most, without any expectation of financial gain. And they've developed their own vaccine that's among the most effective in the world, despite decades of inhumane and unjustified U.S. sanctions. Socialist policies have lifted millions out of poverty, ended famines, raised life expectancies, provided vaccines for the needy, and improved literacy rates many times over. People are losing faith in capitalism because these things are becoming common knowledge. We know the policies work. The internet is a powerful tool for learning the actual history of the world not the sanitized and whitewashed version we're taught in school. There are alternatives. It is a powerful tool. And again, there is no evidence that anything he just said is true. In fact, we see massive famines under socialism. We see starvation. We see torture. We see abuses by government. We see atrocities consistently carried out. Lots of human rights violations. I have never seen one country pulled out of poverty by socialism. And at the end of the day, this idea that he just kind of tried to hint at that it's because of sanctions on socialist economies that they haven't done more, that's laughable. If the only way your socialist economy can function is by leeching on to capitalism in other countries, it probably doesn't work. And if capitalism is increasingly turning into a techno dystopia, we should try those alternatives. Okay, it's one thing to point to trends and say, this could be good if it works out or bad if it doesn't, but we want to ensure a good outcome, right? So. What can average people do to help facilitate the decline of faith in capitalism and the rise in popularity of socialism? Well, to be honest, capitalism is doing a good job of destroying its own image at the moment. If young people can't afford to have kids, or own a home, or go on vacation, or save up to retire, the myth of the American dream evaporates pretty quickly. That being said, it's more difficult to make the jump from capitalism bad to socialism good. The best thing we can do is help others, not help them understand socialism, but actually help them. Is there a mutual aid effort you can donate to or volunteer to help? Do it. Do you have experience fighting evictions or building tenants unions? Offer to help those who are struggling against their landlords. This actually sounds like voluntarism, not socialism, which 
I would tend to support. Go out and actually do good in your own community. Quit looking to the government to come in and save everybody. Take your resources and go voluntarily give them to people. If this were actually what socialism stood for, we could partner on a lot because this is actually what a lot of libertarians and free market capitalists would like to see happen. We don't think the government should be doing a ton of things. We don't think they should be taking our money, but we personally do feel obligated to take care of our communities in a voluntary capacity. So I wish this is what they actually stood for. I think that's just a bunch of baloney. They don't. At the end of the day, they rarely come in and actually um, lobby against government things like zoning um, or historic overlays, things that make rent far more expensive in cities, housing more expensive. We don't see them coming in and lobbying to get rid of occupational licenses that prevent people from being able to work basic jobs. There are many things they could be doing to actually improve the communities and improve the quality of life for people around them, but they don't come and work for those things. They actually come and demand more government regulations, more government infringement, and again, more of the same things that created these problems in the first place. If you're a lawyer, offer pro bono assistance to those under the boot of the ruling class. If you go out to eat or take an Uber, always tip well. When people need help, historically, it's the socialists who are first to lend a hand. That's not true <laughs> at all. We actually see that the U.S., this terrible capitalist country full of evil, hateful people, is consistently ranked the most charitable country in the world. In the world. And that's despite the fact that our government mugs us and takes 30% plus of our income. Despite that, we still give more to charity than any other country. We're an extremely generous people. We do a lot to voluntarily take care of others. We have a huge amount of charities and nonprofits and churches that do incredible work in our communities, and they do it far better than government does despite taking so much of our income. Americans are finally waking up to the fact that socialism isn't scary. If anything, it's the opposite. It's a way to liberate the entire population of the world, to lift the boot of the oppressor, the warmonger, and the invader. It's an ideology that is opposed to the genocidal greed, xenophobia, and hatred of capitalism. Traits that will only continue to get worse as global- um, Do they know what they do to gay people in Cuba and in China? Have they looked into that at all? Economic and ecological crises intensify. If we want to secure a livable future for our children, if we want to see a world where everyone is truly free, we have the blueprint. We just need to take the initiative and make it happen. We do have the blueprint and it is not his, not by a long shot. I feel like I did just watch a propaganda campaign. It's so funny because he kept talking about capitalist propaganda, capitalist propaganda. And I was like, this, this is propaganda. Your entire channel is actual propaganda. And again, I know it's YouTube and there's no way, I guess, to always link sources or back up what you're saying, but so much of what he said was just made up. It had nothing to back it up. It was completely contrary to what actual data shows. And I think at the end of the day, if we're gonna have intellectually honest conversations, like we have to come to that point of agreement of at least acknowledging what is capitalism, what is socialism, and what have been the historical impacts of both. And we can't actually have that conversation because I find very few intellectually honest socialists, which is why you see people like Bernie and AOC constantly trying to cloud who they are and what they want, right? Like we're not socialists, we're just democratic socialists. Like you're socialist. Bernie was over vacationing with the socialists for his honeymoon. You're a socialist. At least own it and be upfront about what your end goals are and what you're trying to achieve. And I just find that really frustrating consistently when I view socialist or communist propaganda. That's what you find. And so we often can't get to the point of having an actual debate or real conversation because at first you have to just debunk so many untruths that they're telling to actually even get to the point where then we can examine the merits of each system. Um, unfortunately, with this video, we really couldn't get to that point. We had to just spend most of the time looking at what he was saying and saying, that's not, that's not accurate, that's not true. I think it's very easy if somebody comes along and tells you all of these things that are going wrong in your life are not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not that you weren't smart enough or you didn't work hard enough. It's that it's the system over here. It's this economic system that's really trapping you and you can't do anything about it. Life is unfair. That's, that's a really seductive ideology to sell young people who maybe don't feel like they're getting to where they want to be. It's harder to tell people that you need to go out and do more. You need to get better. You need to learn new skills. You need to work harder. You need to be smarter. You need to become more educated. That takes effort and self-responsibility. So it is a harder sell, but at the end of the day, the data does back up the system that we espouse here, which is free market capitalism. I would not believe in free market capitalism if the data proved anything else. If you look at every single country where these things have been tried, I would even give it to the socialists and say that socialism has never been fully implemented as they envision it. But every time it has been tried, it has led to mass destitution, deaths, it has led to poverty, it's led to inequality, it's led to human atrocities, civil liberties violations. And I would also argue on the other side that capitalism 
in contrast, has never been fully implemented. But when it has been tried, it has led to massive gains, to prosperity, to longer lives, to wealth creation, to higher standards of living. So it is very obvious to me which system we should keep trying to implement. I'm Hannah Cox with the Foundation for Economic Education, and you've been watching Rigged. If you have another video you'd like to see me react to, leave it in the comments. Thanks for watching.